Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, putting the ops and data ops, orchestrate the flow of data across data pipelines, sponsored today by Stone Branch. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those uh, click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Scott Davis and Robbie Mar Marugason. Scott is the Global Vice President at Stowe Branch with over 20 years of experience in the software technology industry. Scott's tour of duty has included senior leadership roles at such, at such well-known global technology brands as SAP and Cal uh, Calero. At Stone Branch, he leads all corporate growth initiatives across the globe. His expertise extends to international industry market research and analysis and technical marketing. Robbie is a seasoned IT industry professional versed in applications and infrastructure automation, RPA, ITPA, cloud automation, and with a solid background in DevOps and programming. As Stowe Branch EMEA, Ravi is a senior solutions engineer responsible for leading technical conversations and developing the right solution architecture to meet enterprise customer needs in such areas as cloud automation, data pipeline automation, and orchestration and integration strategy. And with that, I will give the floor to our speakers, to Scott and Ravi, to get today's webinar started. Hello. Hello and welcome. Hey everybody, thanks Shannon. And I can't express how excited I am to share this story with this audience. So uh, we've got a whole bunch packed in here. I'll go ahead and just get started. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today is really kind of a mix between uh, DevOps or data ops as, a, as an orchestration layer, uh, we're going to talk about data pipelines. More importantly, we're going to talk about how to orchestrate data pipelines. And then we're going to do a cool demo for you that illustrates how to do it from a practical sense. And then, of course, we'll leave the time open at the end for some Q&A. Uh, I hear this is a chatty group, and I encourage everybody to ask as many questions and interact as much as possible. So uh, let's start off with something simple. This should look very familiar to everybody on this call today. It's your, it's your simple view of a data pipeline. You know, at the, at the beginning of the data pipeline, typically you have some sort of data source, you're doing your collection, you're moving that data via data integration or ingestion. You know, typically this is your ETL phase or your streaming data or your ELT or any number of different acronyms for it. But ultimately you're moving that data to data storage. And this is where you have your data warehouses and your data lakes. Uh, some of your master data management happens here um, or maybe even as a layer above, but we put it in here and then you're passing that information to your analysis phase. Typically that's your machine learning, your predictive analytics, you get your, your data scientist in there playing with the data and then maybe storing it back into a data warehouse that it is then delivered to its audience with your intended users of, it could be anybody, but you're using dashboards, reports, uh, emails, text, whatever, but this is your presentation layer. So I show this up front because I'm gonna show an image similar to this throughout the presentation just to help everybody stay on the same page. So this is a lot more complex than what that last slide shows, of course. And the complexity lies in the types of tools that fall within each of these layers. And the trick is that no single company or even department has or uses the exact same tool. So you could have any number of data, data sources, you could have any number of data integration or ingestion tools, uh, so on and so forth throughout this whole process. And even this is simplified because it's not as linear as this uh, by any, shift, any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I always like to show this slide because it is such a complex thing to tackle, which is why everybody's out there on this call today. So uh, when I think about orchestration, 
of this data pipeline, there's some common ways that people connect the tools today. Uh, number one, they use point-to-point -point integrations. A lot of times they'll use custom scripts, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times they just don't connect them. And this came from actually a discussion I had with Gartner because the initial way that I was illustrating this was yeah, it's point-to-point -point integration with custom scripts. And they're like, hey, Scott, there's, there's really one more big category and it's, it's the, the don't connect at all. And so unfortunately, the reason that is because is there's so many different tools and they can't integrate them uh, properly. So when you're thinking about orchestration, what you're really trying to get to is a centralized view of what's going on in each of the tools, whether they're data tools or data sources or anything along the pipeline I've shown. Uh, within a centralized view that can kind of tell you what's going on from an automation standpoint. Uh, you want to be able to root cause issues and you get that because you have the centralized view, you're able to go in and if something breaks, it's not like looking for a stack of or a needle in a stack of needles, it's a report or a dashboard that says this thing didn't fire, you need to go in and take a look at it, right? It cuts down the time significantly. And a lot of times what you're trying to get to when you're starting to scale these data pipelines is you know, proactive support. So as a, as a data architect or a data engineer or anybody that's involved in the operations of this, uh, these dashboards, these reports that you get help you understand that if something breaks, you're getting to it and fixing it before, you know, worst case scenario, your CEO calls and says, Hey, my report's not updating, what's the deal, right? So it cuts down on this, uh, this tyranny of the moment sort of scenario. But ultimately, when you're trying to get to a proper orchestration solution, it's really to achieve scale. And we'll talk more about that as we get through this. But achieving scale, you know, anybody can go and take uh, one of the approaches I'm about to show and build some level of data pipeline. But it winds up not being sustainable or scalable. So, what are our pain points? What, what keeps us from being able to orchestrate versus just automate? And there's a subtle difference there. Automate, you can automate any single thing, but orchestration requires automating across a lot of different tools uh, in the pipeline. So the pain points, these are the types of things people typically use. They'll use inbuilt schedulers. And what I mean by inbuilt schedulers is just about every data tool or uh, application out there has some sort of built-in job scheduler. These job schedulers uh, aren't unable to connect to other tools typically. So they can schedule what's inside their tool, but they can't schedule what's to the right or left of in the data pipeline. Uh, a good example of this is a, an Informatica, right? It's an excellent tool for ETL and for transformation and for everything that it does, but it has a built-in job scheduler that only schedules things inside of Informatica. And those of you that work with Informatica are probably very familiar with this. Uh, the next option people typically use are open source schedulers. And the most common one in the data world is, uh, is Airflow, right? And data people love Airflow. Airflow and Airflow is good. It's a very good scheduler. The problem is, it's usually batch or time-based. There's some workarounds, of course. I've, I've read about them and, and heard from some customers that they, they, uh, they use some workarounds to get some event trigger-like things using something called DAG that does something. You know, it's, it, it can be done, but it's not efficient and it's not scalable. Uh, but oftentimes in the data world, people start with these open source schedulers, specifically Airflow. They're also doing a lot of their work in cloud schedulers. So, you know, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, um, you name the, the cloud service provider, you know, they have pretty decent schedulers. They have batch schedulers. They even have event-based schedulers. You know, uh, AWS's uh, Lambda is, is a great event scheduler that does real-time triggers. The problem that people run into very quickly with these schedulers is that they're only focused on their own ecosystem. So you have this problem where you really kind of have a lock-in. You're, 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 you're forced to use their ecosystem of services versus trying to do what you really need to do, which is work in a multi-cloud 
Um, and to go a step further, typically a hybrid IT environment, which includes uh, data sources and applications that are on-prem, as well as data sources and applications and data tools that are in the cloud, right? Um, and then finally, you know, we see this most often, just about every company has some sort of, you know, I'd call it a legacy on-premises or mainframe focused uh, scheduler. You know, you'll see the term workload automation out there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of big companies, probably three of them that own most of the market. The problem is they don't work well in the cloud and they're not gonna do a very good job with hybrid IT automation. They will be able to, uh, orchestrate or even automate uh, multiple tools, but they're all gonna be on premises. So you're kind of stuck between these options uh, in most cases. And I would imagine a lot of people are kind of shaking their heads right now, like, yeah, that, that I use that and that and that. And it's never just one of these tools. You're probably using all of them or three of them or two, some mix of these tools and it's causing your, your pain, right? So, I want to take a moment to talk about orchestration a little bit more. So Gartner released this report on Thursday of last week. Uh, it's called Gartner Data and Analytics Essentials Data Ops. It's the second version of this report. And it's not a report as much as it is a presentation. So Robert Thanaraj, who you know, I've had the pleasure of speaking with a whole lot, released this report. It's an update to last year's report. And I've really sort of simplified the view here a whole lot uh, because uh, it's in its final form filled with a whole bunch of tools that uh, is their vendor landscape. Now, I didn't want to steal their slide and put it here, but I wanted to give you guys a sense for what's available in this report and kind of promote it for Robert and for Gartner because it really is a good report about data ops. So if you're looking for, you know, what is data ops? Uh, how does it apply to my business? Go check out this report. There's a link here in this uh, in this deck when you get it. And I believe that Nadia on my team or one of my team members is going to be posting it in the chat. So uh, if you have a Gartner subscription, you can get it. If you don't, I'm afraid you can't. Uh, but uh, you can always see if there's somebody in your business that does have a Gartner subscription getting a hold of it. But it's a good deck. And the thing I really wanted to point out about it is how he has this set up. So this is directionally the by category way that he's looking at data ops vendors. And at the bottom, you kind of have these cloud portfolio service providers. These are the people that are, uh, you know, they have the closest thing to a soup to nuts uh, data ops platform that you can use. And there is no, soup to nuts data ops platform. So usually it's a mix of tools that uh, include a lot of the ones that are in these specialist categories. Serveware off to the right. Uh, these are vendors that typically uh, do a lot for data ops, but it's more from a service side, right? So they have a service that they offer, a consulting service, and then they have some software that they use to help execute it. Uh, all in the middle, you guys are familiar with these terms, these companies, you'd be, uh, you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised by the vendors that you'd see show up in this, in this list. But at the top, you have the orchestrators and he had a layer of orchestration last year, but interestingly, uh, Robert flipped it to the top. And I think that's a better place for it because the orchestration layer is what tags into each of the tools that are mentioned in the specialist piece and help you orchestrate across that data pipeline, which would be similar to what's, what I showed uh, in my opening slides. Now, orchestrators, uh, obviously stone branches in there, right? But uh, to give you a sense of some others, you have uh, BMC, you have Airflow uh, in there as an orchestrator and a few others that, uh, that do similar things to what we do. Now we have a, more unique take on it than them. Everybody has their own spin on it, but there is a legit category that is out there that you may or may not have heard of that I'm just drawing attention to. So go check out the report. It's a good one and you can see all the vendors that, uh, that you can take a look at and, uh, and look and explore, right? So 
let's dive into data pipeline orchestration. Now, you remember my, uh, my simple data pipeline above. I'm gonna keep using this for the next few builds and we'll just use it as a way to, uh, to keep us focused on, uh, on this in more of a simple way. So number one, how do you accomplish this sort of concept of real-time automation, which by the way, needs to include some managed file transfer, file transfer either streaming uh, between clouds or between uh, you know, multi-cloud and a hybrid cloud environment or even a hybrid IT environment where you're trying to get to the, uh, the on-prem world. And so what do you need to accomplish that? Well, first you need to be able to integrate to the tools that are in use within each of these categories. So you're gonna essentially schedule and orchestrate all of the automated processes within those tools along your data pipeline. And the way that you're typically going to get in there uh, are with agents, which is sort of a older way of doing it if APIs don't exist. So an agent would be a little piece of code that you drop on the tool. A lot of times you see this in mainframes or you know, distributed servers, but you know, outside of legacy tech, typically you see APIs in use and they're pretty standard across, uh, across everything in the cloud and even some of the on-prem stuff these days. So once you're connected, once you're uh, building out this automation that is connecting the dots and the workflow across your data pipeline, you get to this, this level of achievement. So number one, uh, we talked about some of this earlier, but you're getting observability. So you get all the log data, you have governance, you have security. It gives you a whole level of security that, that you probably don't have today because you're using open source or individual schedulers that you can't look at it all in one place. Number two, and this kind of goes back to the title, putting the data ops in, or putting the ops in data ops, you get this lifecycle management approach uh, with some of the vendors out there. Obviously, we're one of them because I wouldn't be here talking about it if we weren't, right? But uh, in this scenario, you know, if, if you boil it all down, and I don't want to overly simplify it, but you know, data ops is in a lot of ways just DevOps approaches applied to data. Now it's more convoluted and complex to that, but you know, I've participated in a ton of discussions on it and heard analysts talk. And if you just boil it all down, there's a lot of similarities, right? So what do you get once you apply sort of data ops lifecycle management? Well, you get to develop and you get to have a whole bunch of people working on it, whether they're developers, cloud architects, cloud engineers, uh, cloud architects, uh, IT ops, whoever needs to be involved in the creation of this, then you can test it in another environment, then you can push it to production. And really you can add any number of test dev, test to prod, whatever the, those, those environments are, you can build this whole life cycle and you can simulate it, right? You can make sure that it works before you put it out there into the wild. Uh, the next thing you get when you are doing sort of proper data pipeline orchestration is you get that centralized control and visibility. And when I talk about that, it's not just from a data standpoint, right? A lot of times the data teams and a lot of the people on this call, you guys wanna build and you wanna give it to somebody else. You don't wanna sit there and manage it. That's like a big pain in the butt, right? You wanna go off and build the next thing. Well, what you know and what your ops team knows are two different things. And so your ops team wants to be able to uh, get more visibility at a more aggregate level across not just your pipeline, but all of the pipelines in your company. And so a tool that is a real orchestration platform has the ability to drill into individual flows, uh, pipelines or look at all pipelines together or however you want to look at it. The other thing you get is this ability to create workflows in a very visual fashion. And what Robbie is going to show you in a little bit is what one of those workflows might look like, right? So this is drag and drop capability. This is low code, no code if you want it, or it could be, you know, straight up infrastructure or uh, uh, jobs as code where you're writing it out of uh, Visual Studio or whatever you know, tool you want to use as a developer and pass it up there. So, you know, I've seen data people that depending upon where they started off in their careers, want one or the other or both, right? Uh, they want to be able to write it in a code way or they want to do the drag and drop. Either way, you have both in a, in a proper tool. 
And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you need to be able to root cause the issues as they're happening, not way after the fact. Like the worst case scenario, the thing I always hear is I just don't want to get yelled at again when something breaks. And in this sense, uh, not only can you simulate it and make sure it's going to work before you put it out there, but uh, when something happens, you get immediate alerts. You have like a command center sort of dashboard uh, text alerts you can set off. You can have alerts that shoot off to you know, your help desk solution of choice. I think we'll show uh, ServiceNow as an example. You can have alerts sent to Teams or Slack or however you want to do it, but you, know, you can have the whole world blow up around you if something goes down, so you're on it right away. Now, none of this is possible if you can't integrate. And, you know, I mentioned that at the top, but here's just a few solutions that you'd want to be able to integrate with. But when you, when you kind of look at the whole thing, I like to think it more, think about it more like uh, meta orchestration, right? And this is a term that isn't widely adopted or used across the world, but I've seen it a few places and I like it a lot. So when I think about meta orchestration, what you're really doing is, you know, sometimes you're just orchestrating the automators. You're, you're reaching into something, you know, starting on the left, like AWS Batch or AWS Lambda or even Apache Airflow, uh, and you're using the orchestration tool to reach into those tools and automate them, uh, if that's how you want to do it. And we have a lot of customers, I'll use Airflow as a direct example, that, you know, they want to move over to our tool and have it automate everything eventually, but you know, to get started quick, they don't want to tear down what they've built in Airflow. So they just use our integration with Airflow and they use our tool to centrally control what happens in Airflow. But then that way they get all the monitoring. Oh, and by the way, if you're using Airflow or AWS Batch, you can suddenly make what is time-based uh, automation that is native to those tools, event-based. So you can use our tool to trigger the real-time automation uh, within time-based tools, which is a big benefit. But as you go to the right, you can see just really the sky's the limit in terms of the types of solutions you can tap into. So you have a lot of cloud tools, you have a, cloud of, a lot of infrastructure tools, and uh, you know there's a whole set of webcasts that we can do on each one of these categories, but I just wanna throw it out there so that you guys can get a sense of the types of things that you can meta orchestrate, or in other words, tap into to run their automation that's native within their tools. Or of course you can use our tool direct and go in and automate it on your own. All right, so now we know what we can orchestrate. We know sort of the how to orchestrate. Let's talk about some of the things that you may get with, uh, with the orchestration tool. So one of the things that I've heard a lot uh, with some of the older approaches that people are sort of chained to right now is that you can only, you know, the automation is centralized in a way where like, just like a select few are able to use the tools. So in the data world, it might be uh, just the data team that can use Airflow. In the cloud world, it might just be the few cloud people that have access to it. In the, you know, legacy, mainframe focused workload automation tools, there's usually a group, right? A central group that sits there and runs that. They run a bunch of background processes, but as data people, you don't get to go in there and play with it. You have to like give them orders or ask them to help you and you're begging and pleading to get uh, your stuff worked on. In this orchestration platform that uh, we're talking about here, you get access to the whole kit and caboodle. I mean, you're able to access it either through a pipeline, I'm sorry, a portal, a central portal, where you get to create and do everything that, uh, that, you're allowed, that, that your admin allows you to do, which usually limits you to the integrations and the pipelines that you're responsible for. Um, but you can also access it via the things I've talked about before. ServiceNow, you can go in and trigger workflows or see if a workflow ran, you can get alerts. You got Teams, you got Slack, you got Jira, you got a whole bunch of different tools that really you're in every day that now you get to go in and, uh, and have a lot more control. This is especially important for collaboration. So, you know, if you're a data person that is we're used to working just in your data tools and you know that you need to work with ops and you need to work with your cloud ops team, IT ops team, your uh, developers, whatever, now you guys can all work in the same tool uh, 
on the same builds and it becomes a big thing. So it's, it becomes a centralized collaboration platform. But ultimately, if you're an IT ops person on this call, you can basically provide automation as a service. And uh, the data teams are able to go in and, and do what they need to do. Your ops teams are able to do what they need to do. The developers are going to do what they need to do. But you still maintain that operational visibility to make sure everything's running and that your SLAs and KPIs are met, right? Now, I talked a lot about data ops earlier, so I want to put a little bit more visual uh, representation around that. So in the, op in the data ops uh, scenario, again, a lot like DevOps, what you're doing is you have uh, in our tool or maybe some of the other tools out there, depending on which tool you're looking at, you have an environment where you're doing the development of the orchestration. You have an environment where you're doing the test. You have an environment where you're doing uh, production, right? And this all spans across your CI CD pipeline. Now with our platform, particularly, there's a few different ways you can do this. In this case, I have illustrated in a way where you basically have two or development controller and a production controller. So these are identical systems and there are two ways that you can actually promote something between these, uh, these, these controllers or between the different uh, lifecycle stages. So the first is you can do it with a button that resides inside of our tool that just says promote to the next stage. And so uh, it's very simple. It's done via built-in uh, web GUI. It's all web-based, the whole platform. But of course, I mentioned earlier, some people love working in code. So uh, choose your favorite uh, code development platform, Visual Studio, whatever, and you can promote it via GitHub uh, or any other repository, third-party repository that, uh, that you use. And so you're able to adopt this DevOps-like process or um, as data ops and you can do the lifecycle promotion through your CI CD process, just like you would as a developer working on a piece of code, which is super cool, right? So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Ravi. Uh, Ravi's awesome. He built this pipeline. Ravi doesn't get a chance to speak in a lot of, in front of a lot of people all the time, like I do. So uh, let's, be very patient as he jumps in and he's gonna do awesome and have uh, any questions for us, we'll flip back around and uh, answer them on the Q&A side, okay? So Ravi, here you go. Why don't you take us from here? Thank you very much, Scott. So hello everyone, this is Ravi. So today uh, we're gonna show you how the data pipeline uh, can be orchestrated using the Universal Automation Center. So as you might have uh, seen from the slides from Scott, there are quite a lot of tools available in the market and customers often tend to use the best of breeds across different uh, functionalities in your data pipeline, across uh, data pipeline. So today for our demo, we created a uh, relatively, we, we created a workflow uh, relatively um, with a bunch of tools that's been used across. And um, we show you how it looks like uh, in Universal Automation Center. So in the demo, we have a couple of sources. So you could see um, uh, some of the sources it could be on cloud and uh, some of some of them on on-prem or even apps that generate the data for your data pipeline, right? So uh, we would be using cloud on-prem and apps. Well, and uh, for data ingestion and transformation, we're going to use Informatica. And for your data storage perspective, uh, we're going to use Azure Blob, Snowflake, and uh, AWS S3. So the delivery uh, in the demo would be using Tableau. But uh, essentially, it could be any other uh, business intelligent tools uh, like Power BI, ClickSense, or, uh, or any other tools your data consumer is uh, seeing the value out of the data to get some insights from the data, right? So uh, with this, uh, I will share my screen. So you should be able to see a, a Tableau dashboard, so which we built it for this uh, demo. And um, in this, uh, so before I getting into this Tableau dashboard to give some, uh, to set some context. So 
as you might know, there are various people getting involved in the creation, maintenance, um, or uh, you know, uh, fixing or monitoring the data pipeline. And uh, there are also people uh, who get information out of the data pipeline, and they might not even aware there is a whole data pipeline is running in the background, right? So, to talk about a couple of viewpoints on such players for your data pipeline, we created this dashboard in Tableau, and so this is. This is something your data consumer, in our case, um, you know, it could be the uh, business user who's, uh, who's, who's, who's using this dashboard and uh, sees uh, data out of it. And he sees uh, there is some data missing, right? So uh, in reality, this is a sales data and uh, which is, uh, Come, which, which comes across nationwide from different parts of the country, uh, divided uh, region-wise, east, south, and west, but we're missing with the central region data. So in this case, uh, the business user uh, can't do much. He, he's gonna he's gonna wait for the um, uh, he's gonna wait uh, until the central region data is gonna arrive. So how uh, to so how we he, Meantime, he's gonna wait to talk about the other view. Uh, let me switch my screen. So here in this case, uh, you see uh, Universal Automation Center. So which is uh, our orchestrator and um, we're gonna use this to orchestrate our data pipeline. So uh, to give the other point of view, it could be you know uh, your data architects or the data engineers or the uh, or it could be anyone who's uh, from the data role. Uh, they're working on the data pipeline and they would be at least responsible in one or the other way uh, uh, for maintaining it, fixing it, and uh, when it gets into problems, uh, they take the responsibility of this data pipeline workflow. So. Uh, here in this case, uh, this is the dashboard in specific to the data uh, pipeline orchestration. And uh, they see, they get to see only the uh, jobs and the task, whichever is running across your data pipeline as such. But if you if you look into the Universal Automation Center uh, in a default dashboard, it, it, it supports a variety of uh, use cases. And there could be many other jobs other than data, data ops, uh, the related jobs could be running in the uh, system. So, but we have a, a more specific uh, dashboard for a data ops. But in, in other perspective, here you can see, I, I've logged in as an administrator. So so I, I get to see all around the system what I have, but you could also have a dedicated uh, login or uh, roles and responsibilities uh, created for this data ops user, and they get to see only the items related to data ops. So for this, to give to give you a view on that, I've logged in with another user, say called a data ops user. He has logged in, and then he gets to see only the data ops uh, dashboard. But he could see maybe there is a default dashboard, but he don't have access to any other dashboard. So, but he's he's free to work on his uh, data ops elements. He could uh, he could create it, he could run it, and then he could build a pipeline using this uh, login credentials, and he. Could could have limited access only to the set of credent set of elements or the automation elements with respect to data ops, right? So switching back uh, to my original screen to give a bit of a uh, overview on this dashboard. So you could see the first box here, it gives you a different set of jobs that we're gonna use in our data pipeline. So as a, uh, as a um, uh, as we have seen previously in the slide. So there, there are different sources and uh, uh, different uh, tools for data ingestion and transformation and for delivery using Tableau. The same set of items you're gonna see in this, uh, in this, in this box, right? So there is a Tableau job, there is a Snowflake job, there is uh, some Power BI data breaks, Azure Data Factory related jobs. So, and, and, and more or less um, these jobs we're gonna use uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I go into the workflow, you would be seeing how this jobs are getting executed using the Universal Automation Center, right? So below, you could see there is there are some more boxes which is um, you know uh, which deals with the uh, SLA violation, for example. Say uh, this box essentially deals with the forecasted SLA violation. So when you run your data pipeline, so 
if any SLA breach is forecasted, meaning uh, your data is going to be delivered late, or your pro uh, some of your processing with one of your tool maybe takes a longer time than expected, then uh, we have the capability to predict uh, there is something going wrong, and then you you might your your data might be delivered late. So in this case, uh, there is a forecast, and then the users in the downstream could be you know cascaded with the information. There's a potential delay. And uh, also there's another box which deals with SLA violation, which, which actually says what are the actual uh, violations happening in the system. So there could be late uh, job is expected to start. It's not already started, something like that, right? So, and to the right, uh, we have the data ops, alerts and notifications. So this essentially speaks about what are the different kinds of notification we send across uh, during your data pipeline execution. So uh, during your pipeline execution, say for example, if you need to send an SLA alert, if you need to send an email, so what are the actions so far we have taken? So for this breach, we have already sent some notification and we have executed some things. So throughout the execution, there might be a few other notification which be going, which would be going across uh, different teams, whoever is responsible for it, right? So we can see as a as a, as a, as a whole view what is happening across your uh, data ops uh, workflow execution. You could understand from a, a generic view in this dashboard. Now let's get into the workflow execution. So to get into the workflow execution, let me um, show, show the workflow. So uh, before we get into this workflow here, uh, there are a couple of views uh, or a couple of perspective you could uh, you could you could uh, visualize from here. So one could be your uh, data flow, another one could be your control flow. So right. So the data flow, uh, what I mean is moving the data from source all the way to your delivery, right? So this is your data flow, and uh, the control flow is essentially not the data flow. So it, 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 it speaks about, it, it tells uh, how you orchestrate the data between the uh, tools uh, that you're using uh, to transform and manipulate the data and then handing it over to the delivery. So essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's all about the orchestration, the control flow speaks. So when we move across the workflow, um, we can see uh, the actual differences, right? So there are a variety of ways we can uh, launch the data pipeline uh, workflow. So in this case, uh, we are waiting or monitoring for an event. And um, uh, th this could be essentially hooked up uh, to your, uh, uh, this could be essentially hooked up to a webhook, meaning um, a, a third party or, or third party, rather a business application when it finished with uh, all its process and then uh, to give a go on the data pipeline, they could send, they could call a webhook and then from that webhook, we could trigger uh, uh, this workflow in real time. So uh, that's one possibility. Again, uh, if you're using Kafka kind of a tool, so Kafka could publish an event and then we could, pick up the event and further uh, launch this workflow in real time. But in our uh, demo scenario, right now we are waiting for a, we are monitoring an uh, AWS SQS messaging queue. So we are looking for a, a message in a message or an event uh, that's message in the um, AWS SQS queue. Once that message has been dropped in and we're gonna we are good to quick start with the uh, data extraction and further uh, process in the workflow. To, to, to simulate this process, so I'm going to drop a message uh, to AWS SQS messaging queue using Postman. So let me open up my Postman. And here is my post message to the SQS queue. Let me send it. As soon as I send this message to Postman, uh, the job which is doing the monitoring on SQS queue would go to success and further, we would be beginning with our uh, data extraction process. So, so this indicates uh, your central region data has, um, uh, we got the approval to go ahead with the extraction of the central region data. So, and uh, maybe it's end of business or end of the day. So however, and whatever process has been sent, set, set up across your landscape. So that indicates um, a go uh, for the data extraction, right? So uh, immediately, once we get that even, then we get we trigger our SAP data extraction process. And this extracts the data from the SAP and then um, keeps it in the application server. In the same way, we have a Windows job. This extracts the data from the Microsoft SQL server and keeps it in the application server. And uh, now, 
we we need to move this data to a central repository further. So in order to move this data further, uh, we're doing some pre-checks. So uh, say, for example, if the central repository has sufficient space or if the directory is clear so that we can ship the freshly extracted data moved into the central repository. So this is actually a, a, a space availability check we kept in place, just a prerequisite, right? So as soon as we release this, this is gonna check the space in the target directory. If all this space is sufficient space available, then it goes to success. And then we do some uh, cleanup activity in the central uh, repository before we transfer the freshly transferred data. And uh, Post that, we have uh, file transfer tasks. So to showcase um, um, uh, a strong branch uh, capability of file transfer, we have um, uh, inbuilt uh, file transfer tasks, uh, which is capable of supporting different protocols, including our own proprietary protocol for file transfer, right? So uh, we have a file transfer protocol named Universal Data Mover, which is a Stone Branch proprietary protocol, and which is helpful to transfer data uh, across uh, source to destination using the uh, you know, using the agents, and it's fast and secure. And uh, to show and and to showcase another other uh, traditional uh, file transfer protocols using SFTP, FTPS, um, and um, a traditional FTP kind of a protocol. In this case. Uh, we use SFTP to transfer the uh, SQL server extract data, right? So for the SAP server data extract goes on via the file transfer mechanism called UDM, which is from branch supported and the uh, other one goes via SFTP. So now we came to the phase uh, where we need some approval. So to add a business layer on top of this uh, data pipeline orchestration. So beyond this, uh, to continue with this workflow, uh, someone from the business layer need to give an approval so that it could be a, the workflow could be continued further. So there could be a variety of ways an approval could be raised. In this case, we use the manual task and uh, we send the approval notification across uh, different channels, say your traditional uh, uh, mail, uh, email service, email approval, or it could be your modern uh, Slack uh, messaging platform and Teams platform, which could deal interactive messages. You know, uh, we could uh, drop an approval message there and then the user or the business user on a click of a button, this job and approval is done from their messaging platform. In this case, we are transferring the approval message to Slack and uh, Slack would post an approval notification. In this case, the business user gets to see what for this approval notification has come for. And, um, you know, uh, it says, what are the list of files has been dropped into the central repository? Is it good to go? Uh, he can, uh, whether he can approve this um, uh, process further. So it's going to be compute heavy process uh, going further, right? So he's going to click on the approve button. As soon as he clicks on the approve button, the task over there, um, it says who has approved uh, from compliance perspective in Slack. And then um, if we go further, you could see the job here over here goes to success. So the approval is done. Now what we're going to do in our pipeline is to, you know, um, upload the data from the central repository to the cloud storages. So SAP data, what we extracted uh, gets into the Azure uh, cloud, Azure blob. Uh, and the SQL Server data extract, what we have extracted, it gets into the um, uh, AWS S3 bucket, right? So, uh, so now the data, both of this source data is available in the cloud platform. Now we can trigger the Informatica process. So Informatica, uh, we are not trying to replace anything or we are not pushing the data into Informatica server in this case, right? So Informatica has its own integrations. We has its own job built within the Informatica platform. Uh, it knows how to fetch the data from uh, Azure Blob and AWS S3. So, uh, and it also has its own workflow engine. So with subsequent steps, what it has to do. In this case, we go to Informatica. Once we, once we say that we finish with this process, Informatica knows um, it's going to fetch the data from Azure Blob and then AWS S3 and loads it and transforms the data. So once it finish, with its transformation. So it's 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 gonna further kickstart uh, the Snowflake process, which is our cloud data warehousing, right? So Snowflake also has its own integrations. So Snowflake can directly connect or talk to AWS buckets. So 
in this case, Snowflake, we're going to load Snowflake tables uh, directly from the transformed data, which Informatica has uploaded. We're going to fetch it from the Cloud Azure blob for SAP. And in the same way, we're going to fetch the AWS S3 uh, uh, data, which the transformed data uh, in the other uh, Snowflake job, right? So if you look at the integration uh, here, uh, it's not, I mean, here you, will, you might be able to, do, you might find the difference between the data flow and the control flow. So uh, Informatica, um, Informatica knows where it has to pick the data and uh, how it transforms and where it puts the data back, right? So it's a point-to-point -point integration within Informatica. So uh, the job is there within Informatica. It knows where, it, what it takes and what it does. So in the same way uh, with Snowflake. So Snowflake knows, uh, it, it knows to fetch the data from here and then um, it, it, it needs to load the data into its tables. So in this case, we're just, uh, we are completely orchestrating the data. We're not dictating the data flow, right? So uh, that's the difference. So while we speak, we saw the Tableau job has uh, gone to success, right? So this means the central data might have been published and the business user uh, would get notification. So, so we could send a real-time uh, email uh, as soon as we finish with the Tableau job saying that uh, the job is uh, done uh, and the central region data might be available. Let's refresh the Tableau dashboard. And once we refresh, you could see the central region data has come in already. And um, as you could see across the other dashboards also, we see the central region data. So now the business user gets all of his uh, sales data from nationwide and he's happy with his goal. But switching back to the workflow, you could see um, there is also another part to the workflow. So it could be that the same workflow could be used by two different teams. In this case, our data uh, analyst team or the data science team wants to use this transformed data uh, for their machine learning uh, models. So they want to train this data uh, using their machine learning models. So in this case, we use altogether a different set of tools. We use Azure Data Factory and we use Azure Data Bricks uh, uh, for um, doing the machine learning models. And then they're going to visualize the data in Power BI in this case. So in the previous scenario, we used Tableau. In this case, we used Power BI, right? So this Power BI job is failing intentionally to showcase, uh, I mean, what could be the uh, real, uh, uh, what, what could be the real time scenarios which, you, which we might uh, face uh, during the data pipeline orchestration. In case of a failure, uh, there are different notifications being uh, sent across uh, different channels, right? For example, your Slack gets a notification saying that a job has failed. And likewise, um, you also get a, a service now ticket. So if you, if you look into the service now ticket, it says there's a ticket for the Power BI failure. So the, so we know in the, in the data pipeline, something went wrong and there is a ticket and some user has to work on it. In this case, the Power BI user would get to work on it. They can immediately grab the output and see what's happening across. And in the same way, uh, the modern incident management tools like PagerDuty has more advanced functions. In this case, we also create an incident with PagerDuty and see, you can see the job logs attached to the PagerDuty, but we also, um, have other features say for example if the operations of the ops team needs to rerun the job or force finish set the job to okay and continue with the rest of the flow in this case if you, if we fairly assume that the power bi team has done its work and need to you know uh, they need to uh, set this job to okay they can just click off a button uh, the, we call a webhook action and then the controller knows okay this job is already set to okay uh, from the power bi team and then we we will finish this job automatically and go to completion so meanwhile when we switch back we already completed with the data pipeline orchestration. We send the email across different teams and they get to date the notification, right? When you get to the dashboard and refresh it, we have done. We have uh, we finished with the entire process. There are these are the different kind of alerts we have sent to different teams, right? So this is uh, more or less uh, the end of the data pipeline uh, demo. I will hand it over back to Scott. Scott, you're still muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ravi, and very well uh, done. In case you guys couldn't tell, Ravi is actually a pro and does this all the time. So it's, uh, it is a really good use case um, that 
shows the flex of the orchestration capabilities all the way from uh, the entire pipeline, but then with a few add-ins like the self-service capabilities and the, uh, the, the checks and the BPM-like activities where you can uh, have manual approvals. You know, so it, it really gives a good example of uh, something simple, right? I mean, we, of course, it can, can become a lot more complex. We have people that create workflows that you'd think are a mile long with, uh, with tasks and jobs, but it's all uh, something that can work together. What I wanted to do real quick is just talk through a couple of, or at least one use case here. So um, I can't share the name of these guys, but they're one of the largest global food manufacturers uh, headquartered out of France. And uh, what's interesting with them and their sort of challenge that they faced was they had a, a data pipeline. It was built in Azure with Data Factory and it worked great in, in, in the Azure environment, right? Just like I talked about earlier, they were kind of locked in though to the, uh, to the Microsoft Azure environment with their, with their data pipeline. But they had Informatica and they had Snowflake and they had all these other tools that they wanted to include in it. And they had a real focus on doing it in real time. So they couldn't settle for something that was done in a, in a batch or a time-based uh, time based way. So to uh, not spend too much time on it, this is an example of what they built using the same framework that I showed before. So, you know, in their, in their case, they had S3 as a data source, Google Cloud as a data source, and then some other application databases. They still used Azure Data Factory for the Azure side of the business, but they also used Informatica. So they actually used two different uh, uh, data integration uh, tools for ingestion. They had a whole bunch of different data storage places they were putting stuff for different use cases. And they had the analysis layer and then finally the delivery layer that went out to Power BI. Now, I like to tell this, this story uh, because it really showcases the, uh, the pipeline, but also some of the things they were looking for. So uh, file transfer was a big part of it. A lot of times, uh, if you're using uh, a standalone scheduler, you don't have managed file transfer built into it. Well, with our tool, you do, right? And some of the, some of the more, I, I don't wanna be specific about our tool only, really in, in enterprise grade schedulers, things that are common in the market, you'll find that they have some sort of managed file transfer built into it. Um, but data ops from a process or data ops lifecycle was very important to them. Being able to simulate things before they pushed them into production was a key thing. It was like number one on their RFP when they first came to us. And, you know, from a uh, integration standpoint, it was a big challenge for them to connect their on-prem world to their cloud world. And that's a big piece of what we came in and fixed. And, you know, one of the other things that they talked about when I had a chance to speak with them after, uh, after everything was said and done and the, they'd been using it for, you know, almost a year was that one of the, the other criteria that wasn't evident in the RFP was this, this aspect of collaboration amongst teams. So they had, uh, in addition to all these other tools that, that we've talked about, they had one of these uh, legacy workload automation tools and they needed to be more agile. In fact, what did he say? It was a quote, something like, you know, the cloud is, cloud is agile and our automation needed to be too. And what he meant by that was all of his, uh, or all of their uh, automation had to go through one centralized automation group because it was an on-premise tool and you couldn't make it so that your developers and your data people and uh, your cloud people could all come in and, and collaborate on these uh, on these these workflows. So fast forward a year, they're using it and it's not just the data pipeline they're orchestrating more, they're orchestrating everything. Like there's, they're actually orchestrating their old workload automation tool from our tool. So I mean, it's pretty crazy what you can do with it. Uh, once you have it in. So at the risk of doing just a very brief commercial, listen, we have a 
platform that does this stuff. Managed data pipelines, you can see at the very bottom of this, uh, of this circle, and it is a big piece of, uh, of our, our sort of pillar or set of pillars of what we do. But as you look around this, we talked about just about all these things uh, today. You're event-driven, meaning that you can be real-time. You have beautiful workflows you can build. Uh, there's a lot of self-service capabilities built in. We didn't talk about infrastructure and service automation today, but that's a big part of our cloud story, right? Uh, being able to orchestrate things like Teradata, or sorry, Terraform and Ansible and Jenkins and uh, Chef and Puppet or doing infrastructure on your own. So all that real-time hybrid IT automation uh, across your on-prem cloud and containerized microservices, right? So that's us. Uh, I saw a comment come in uh, in the chat when it was first there, and I'll just address it real quick because I happen to have a slide. You know, the question was something along the lines of, you know, how do you how do you integrate? Well, we have a ton of pre-built integrations. We put a lot of focus specifically on data pipeline uh, out on our website. You can check it out. It's called the Integration Hub, and you know, for free uh, for ninety nine percent of the integrations, with the exception of like our SAP integration, which is uh, much more detailed and uh, deeply deployed than all the other integrations, uh, they're free, right? You can come in, you can grab them. All the ones we showed today are out there. So I, I encourage you to check it out. We add new integrations daily, weekly, monthly. It, it, it's just constantly coming out. We have a whole team of people that are building them. And uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention here is, you know, in addition to the ones that we make, our customers make them too. So we have a software development kit, templates, documentation, and we have customers that, you know, are off building their own and deploying their own because they're either not available through us, uh, they don't want to come to us to get them, or uh, they just have the capability, right? They can do it fast uh, in hours, not days, right? Um, so there's a uh, there's a really cool place you guys can go search around and see what's available. If we don't have it on there right now, ask. We may have one in development or in production with a customer that we can just change or we can build them in days. So uh, what do you want to look for sort of in summary in a data pipeline orchestration solution? Number one is real-time data flow. I mean, this is the differentiator between Airflow and some of the other tools out there. You really want something that can get you a real-time scenario. Data ops enabled, critical, especially if you're building at scale, you don't wanna push something out there that's a mess or doesn't work. Uh, so, and you wanna be able to get the right people in there to test it and play around with it. Proactive monitoring and learning, uh, built-in managed file transfer, I think is an important one, especially from the data pipeline world and just overall centralized control. And the last thing I'll mention here is just the lower left-hand corner, which is, Kubernetes, Docker, container technology, you know, that that is something that a lot of our customers uh, really care about, especially in the cloud world. And, you know, there's some vendors in this space doing data pipeline orchestration where their whole approach is built around containers. Well, you know, of course we can do containers, but we can not, right? And so just know that that's, uh, that's something that you that you should be looking for because if you have not fully adopted it yet, your cloud world will in the near future. Now, with that said, I think we have some time for some Q&A. So I will pause, let Shannon take us back and ask some questions. Robbie and I will do our best to answer them. If we cannot answer them here, we will get back to you afterwards. I love it. Thank you so much. If uh, there's been some questions coming in throughout the chat, uh, presentation in the chat here, if you have questions, feel free to submit in the q and I think we have time to get in at least one or if not two. Um, does the platform support jobs as code? Yeah, I saw that one come through. So yes, absolutely, jobs as code. You know, we didn't invent the term jobs as code, BMC did, uh, but BMC is one of those big Goliath giant companies. So we adopted the term and uh, just like with BMC, you would create it uh, if you want to using your uh, Visual Studio, or your SDK, or I'm sorry, your uh, your, uh, development tools and push it up to a, a Git hub or whatever and uh, and be able to move it around like that. So you can create all this stuff as code. You can do infrastructure as code, jobs as code, and uh, 
So yes, is the answer. I love it. Um, you know, we are right up at, at the top of the hour here, but just to answer the most commonly asked questions here, just a reminder, I will um, be sending a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording. Um, and there's been a couple other things requested throughout. Um, Stone Branch also asked that we post a little survey just so you can take a little survey on how um, they did. So feel free to fill that out. It's in the chat section there for y'all. Um, I'll put that in the follow-up email as well. Um, and then Scott and Rami, I apologize. We don't have much time for any more of the questions, but I'll get those over to you and get the chat over to you so you have um, the opportunity to answer Great. those. We'll be sure to follow up with people individually with questions uh, that we receive. And uh, we'd just like to say thanks for spending the time with us. You know, I said at the top of the hour, but this is, uh, or at the bottom of the hour, this is, this is an exciting one for us. We're loving the customers that are using it. They're loving us. And uh, anybody who wants to take a look, just give us a call. Love it. Again, thank you so much. Thanks to Stone Branch for sponsoring today's event and hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you.